Welcome back. So in this final part to chapter one, we're going to talk about the three major kinds of research that are used to examine questions in psychology and the strengths and the weaknesses of each of those types. The first kind of research is descriptive research. Descriptive research is like what was done by Jane Goodall in the 1970s in Gombe, in that she was one of the first people to go out and observe chimpanzees in their natural world. So that's actually, up until then, that was had not really happened. So Jane Goodall was one of the first people to observe animals in their natural habitat to see what kinds of things they were doing, both their social structure, their behaviors, how they got along socially, what they were eating, how they hunted, all of that sort of came out as part of her original work. Descriptive research is this generic kind of research where you're describing characteristics of a group in the real world, in their natural setting. So it's not done in a laboratory. It's not trying to examine different kinds of hypotheses to figure out why things happen. At this point, it's usually an exploratory, exploratory kind of research where you're just trying to understand what are animals or humans doing in their natural world. If I wanted to understand how fifth graders um, are studying effectively inside the classroom, then I might want to actually go into the classroom to observe them, right? I don't necessarily want to watch them at home. I don't want to watch them on the playground. I don't want to bring them into a lab. I just want to get an idea about what are they actually doing in the classroom. This could either be a large study where you examine dozens or hundreds or even thousands of fifth graders, or if you're trying to look at a more unusual case, you might look at only a small group or maybe even a single individual. So of course, that would be a case study. A case study is a kind of descriptive research where you're looking at an unusual situation or event and how it might have affected a small number of people. Now, all kinds of research suffer from the problem of sampling bias. If you were to only go and look at fifth graders in Pleasanton or Danville, that's going to be very different than fifth graders in Arizona um, or in Nevada or in Florida or other places. So one of the things you want to make sure you do is you've got good representation, right? That you've got people from a variety of different backgrounds, learning styles, ethnicities, genders. Right? You don't just want to look at how boys behave in a classroom. Um, so, but sampling bias is actually not just a problem of descriptive research, it is a problem of any kind of research. And lastly, descriptive research can't really test hypotheses. We're really just trying to examine or observing what's actually happening in the real world. It, it wouldn't be used to test a hypothesis at this point. So as I mentioned, a case study is a specific kind of um, uh, descriptive research. It's where you examine a single case in great detail. If you wanted to understand what is it like to be the Dalai Lama psychologically, right? There are not very many individuals who meet that um, identity. So that would be a case study um, similar to the case of Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a railroad supervisor in the 1800s who unfortunately had an iron, three foot long iron tamping rod um, that was sparked some dynamite and it was blown through his cheek behind his eye. You can see his eye is closed there in the picture. And you can see this is a computer generated reconstruction. You can see the iron tamping rod went up behind his eye, out the top of his head. So these kinds of unusual cases tell us something about the events that lead to psychological change. The problem with these kinds of events is that you never really know for sure. Is the Dalai Lama's personality a product of the environment he was raised in? Or maybe he's biologically different than other individuals. Is it a product of his religion? Is it a product of his social environment? Similar, is Phineas Gage, after he had this accident, he had a significant number of behavioral problems. He became an alcoholic. He was highly aggressive. He had no impulse control. Is that a product of the damage that happened to his brain? Or is it a product of other things, the trauma that happened to him? Um, he got a fungal infection. Is it a product of the fungal infection? That's one of the problems with case studies is that we never really know what the cause was of that change because they have a small number of participants. It's really hard to know for sure. If I actually wanted to know the cause of changes in behavior, like with Phineas Gage, was it the loss of that part of his brain that caused him to become aggressive and impulsive? I would need experimental research. In experimental research, I expose subjects or participants to different situations or environments, and I measure the effect on their behavior. So 
I might want to take a case where I look at individuals who have suffered from accidents. Uh, let's say people who suffer from motorcycle accidents. People who suffer from motorcycle accidents, some of them will come off the front of their bike and they'll get damaged to that same part of the brain that Phineas Gage did. And we could look at comparing individuals who had that kind of accident that damaged the frontal part of their brain or the frontal lobe. And we can compare them to people who also came off their bike and had a similar had a similar amount of damage, but to a different part of their brain. Okay, And then that would tell us whether the damage to the frontal lobe potentially causes changes in um, impulse control. Now, with that example, we never really know. Were those people already impulsive before they had the accident? Um, maybe motorcycle riders in general are all very impulsive. Um, in the best kinds of experimental research, like in a rat study, you would actually experimentally induce damage to the frontal lobe. You might use a, a small um, scalpel to remove part of the frontal lobe and see if that actually changes rat's aggressiveness or impulse control. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, animal research is critical to trying to answering some of these questions that you really can't answer in humans. In experimental research, there are two kinds of variables that you measure. There is an independent variable. The independent variable is the variable that is manipulated by the researcher. So if I'm going to experimentally induce damage in rats' frontal lobes, that's the independent variable, right? Whether they had damage or not, maybe I had a set of control rats that never had anything done to their brain. And then I would measure whether or not that had some effect on another variable, which is called the dependent variable, okay? The dependent variable is the variable that I measure. So think about it, in my example with rats, I supposed, I hypothesized, that by removing frontal lobe tissue from rats, there would be a change in their behavior. What kinds of behaviors would I look for in rats? Pause the video and give me two or three. So did you suggest aggressive behavior? Did you suggest alcohol consumption? Maybe you suggested impulse control. All of those might be behaviors that you could try to look at in rats. Those would all be dependent variables. Another way to think about it is the dependent variable depends on, right? it changes because of the manipulation of the independent variable. Do a couple more examples of this to kind of make sure you got the idea of the difference between a dependent and an independent variable. We also want to make sure in an experiment that we've removed every other variable. So we want to make sure that rats are not becoming more aggressive because of um, differences in social experience. Maybe young rats are less socially experienced and get in more fights. We want to make sure it's not because of differences in personality. Right? I was mentioning with the motorcycle riders, maybe motorcycle riders who come off the front of their bike are more impulsive in the first place. So maybe it's not that it's the brain damage, but it's something about their personality already. You would need to control for those variables to make sure to rule those out in a true experiment. So experimental research allows us to determine cause and effect, right? It can remove the influence of other variables. If we've got a great experiment where we know the only thing that's different between these rats is that some of them had their frontal lobe removed and some of them did not, that gives us pretty high confidence that the frontal lobe is involved in, impulse, in impulsive behavior. But experimental research suffers from a few problems. First, rats are not always a perfect model of humans. Um, even monkeys aren't always a perfect model of humans, right? They don't have some of the social complexity, the coping mechanisms, um, and artificial um, laboratory studies may be very artificial. Experimental research, if you've controlled everything else in this rat's life, um, it doesn't look like humans anymore, right? It doesn't look like the real world. So you really want a balance of having descriptive research and experimental research to make sure that you're modeling what's actually happening in the real world. You also may have a problem called participant bias. Maybe your participants figure out what's going on. So this is very common in human research. If I were doing a drug study where I wanted to test out a new antidepressant drug and I told one group of participants you're going to get a placebo or a sugar pill and I told another group of participants you're going to get the drug that's supposed to reduce depression and they know what they're going to get they may be biased in reporting whether or not they think their symptoms get better, right? Now, this doesn't really happen very much anymore, right? Normally, participants are blinded through a single blind procedure, so they don't know whether they're receiving the drug or the placebo, 
but it is possible to figure it out, right? Antidepressant drugs often cause diarrhea and stomach upset. So if one person's on the placebo and has no stomach upset and their friend is on the experimental drug, they may be able to figure out pretty quickly, oh, I think I'm on the treatment. And that could then also bias their results. Experimenter bias is where the experimenter is biased. And usually this is inadvertently. Maybe the way that the experimenter interacts with the participants, maybe when the experimenter knows that they're interacting with somebody who's on the placebo, maybe they're not as interested, maybe they don't ask as many probing questions during the interview to find out how the participant is doing. So to reduce experimenter bias, we use a single blind procedure. I mean, to reduce experimenter bias, we use a double blind procedure in which the experimenter who's doing the interviews also doesn't know um, what group the participant is. Somebody knows, but usually it's not the interviewer who's actually interacting with participants, right? Maybe it's the lab manager or someone else. So another kind of research is non-experimental or correlational research. In non-experimental research, you're not actually attempting to change the variables. You're just examining how two variables are related to one another. For example, I'm going to look at the relationship between hours of sunlight during the day and your mood. So in summer, the hours of sunlight goes up, so does your mood maybe. In winter, the hours of sunlight goes down and maybe your mood also goes down. Now, there are two different kinds of correlations we might see. There can be a positive correlation, which is like the one I just described. In a positive correlation, both variables change in the same direction. So the more hours of sunlight, the higher your mood. The less hours of sunlight, the lower your mood. Another example of a positive correlation, the more hours of studying you do, the higher your grade on an exam. A negative correlation is not a bad correlation, it just means that they change in opposite directions. So a negative correlation might be that the more alcohol you drink the night before an exam, the lower your exam score. Right? So as one variable goes up, the other one is going down. Those are changing in opposite directions. One of the problems with correlational research is that you can never really determine cause and effect. I don't know, and it seems unlikely, that your mood is directly related to hours of sunlight. I realize there are certain disorders that seem to be related to that, but for the most of the population, I would guess that there are some psychological changes that happen during summer that are not related to hours of sunlight, but are related to other things like work schedule, school schedule, right? Non-experimental research or correlational research offers often suffers from the problem of not being able to de determine causal relationships. So be careful of those. Here's a couple of examples. Each of these represents a positive or a negative correlation. So take a look at them and try to figure out which, which one each is. First, identify the two variables. Then, whether they both change in the same direction, which would make it a positive correlation, or the opposite direction, which would make it a negative correlation. Pause the video here to work on this. Okay, so Professor Johansson finds that for every diet beverage someone drinks, the likelihood of a heart attack increases by 4%. More diet beverages, that's going up, and the greater the heart attack risk, that's also going up. That would be a positive correlation. Again, positive doesn't mean good or bad, okay? It just means they're both changing in the same direction. That would also mean that lower diet beverage consumption might be correlated with lower risk of heart attack. Margaret notices that the temperature in her office drops several degrees from July to December, and also that her utility expenses drop from July to December. Those are both going in the same direction. They're both going down. That is also a positive correlation. Dr. Fontaine finds that for every day a person attends exercise, so every extra day that's going up, you lose a half a percent of body fat, so that's going down. So that's a negative correlation, okay? So every day of exercise class you attend, you lose body fat, um, so your body fat percentage is going down. So that's a negative correlation. Lastly, Professor Handel finds that students who attended the exam review session, um, and the longer they attended the review session, the lower their exam scores. Okay, whoa, wait a minute. The longer you attend the review session, the lower your exam scores? So that's a negative correlation, but it's kind of a surprising one. So remember, correlation does not equal causation. There are some likely alternative explanations for most of these. For example, 
it may not be that diet beverages are connected to heart attack risk, and in fact, there is no evidence showing a link between diet beverage consumption and heart attacks. But there is a link between um, dietary habits and heart attack risk. So maybe if you're consuming diet beverages, you're also eating other unhealthy foods that may be correlated with a greater risk of heart attack. Maybe for Dr. Fontaine's exercise class, maybe people who exercise a lot um, are also dieting. Most research suggests that exercise alone does not help to reduce body fat. Even though people swear by it, the evidence just doesn't support it. It's really caloric restriction. It's reducing what you eat to change your body fat percentage. Lastly, Professor Handel. So why is it that the longer you student, a student spends at a review session, the lower their exam score? Is Professor Handel confusing them? Is he or she, um, or is she, sorry, uh, making them lose information? Is she giving them false answers? Not likely. The students who left the review session early probably felt better about the material, and maybe they felt better prepared and did better on the exam. Students who stayed longer at the review session probably were hoping for some additional information to help them get more comfortable, right? If you're going to be at a review session, you're going to spend more time there because you need additional help. So for, all of, for most of these, there are clear ex alternative explanations that could describe all of these. So those are the three major kinds of research. Now let's start to look at them in various chapters throughout the course.